Äh, hi Freunde der Tiefen, Sie Lihun hier, hier äh, wie immer auf Laser gucken lernen, mit der IP 192 ähm, Ich bin natürlich perfekt vorbereitet und habe jetzt nicht wirklich einen Talk hier. Es gibt einmal Regen. Oh, es gibt nur einen. Ja, Regen Bug Bounty. Also, boah, habe ich gar keinen Bock auf den Talk. Ja, <lacht> äh, ja okay, ich. Äh, 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 Leute, mh. ist da ein Name? Das ist ein Fleck auf meinem Bildschirm. Ich denke, ich muss kurz einen Talk raussuchen, weil es geht ja so nicht weiter. Und irgendwie tendiere ich gerade dazu, all den Stein, den ich gerade meine, wieder zu verballern. den noch für die Außenwand. Oh mein Gott, ich habe in dieser Welt schon so viel Stein gefarmt. Das wollte ich gar nicht wissen. Das ist echt krass. Und dann alles weg. Tja, das passiert, wenn man sein Haus zu nah am Spawn baut, Leute. Immer weit genug weggehen. Hm. Okay, also hier muss unbedingt ein neuer Talk her. Och, mein Inventar, Bruder. Äh, fuck. Ugh. Der eine oder andere wundert sich vielleicht, wieso ich diesen Stein immer verbrenne. Die Antwort ist ganz einfach, ich mag den nicht. Okay, ja, äh, ich denke, ich suche kurz einen Talk raus. Also, das wird jetzt zu so blöd. Ähm, Death Kuhn. Oh, was war das denn? Dann filtern wir nach Creative Commons. Babdi Boop die Was in den Windows Defense Simulator? Uh, wieso nicht? Das sieht doch lustig aus. Hi. Okay, also Leute, wir pumpen jetzt ähm, Defcon 26 von Alexei Bul Bua Bulasel. Oh mein Gott, ich sollte einfach aufhören, diese Namen auszusprechen. Reverse Engineering Windows Defender Simulator. Emulator. Uh, yeah, let's go. My name is Alex Bolazel. I'm here to present on my research on reverse engineering Windows Defender's antivirus emulator. Oh, we have an antivirus. Before we get started, I am a security researcher at For All Secure. We may know the company from their victory at the Cyber Grand Challenge uh, two years ago at DEF CON 24 with the Mayhem CRS. I also do firmware reverse engineering and cyber policy at Riverloop Security. I'm a very proud alumnus of RPI and RPI SEC. They're playing over in the CTF right now, and I want to say good luck, guys. And this is my first time speaking at Defcon, so it's great to be here. Ooh. Shots, shots, uh, this shots. This is my personal research, and uh, is my own views, not those of my employers or anyone else I've previously worked for. Classic. Before we get started, I do want to say this presentation is a deeply technical look at reverse engineering Windows Defender's binary emulator. And as far as I know, the first conference talk to really look at reverse engineering the antivirus emulator uh, for any AV product. It's not an evaluation of Windows Defender. I'm not going to tell you whether this is a good product you should use in your network or not. I'm not going to tell you whether it catches viruses uh, effectively relative to other AVs or anything like that. And also, this talk does not address Windows Defender ATP or any other technology under the Windows Defender name. This is about Windows Defender Antivirus, the traditional endpoint AV product. So when I line this talk, I'm going to go through an introduction. Then talk about my tooling and process, how I did what I did. Uh. Then reverse engineering and the rhythm of the presentation. I did a vulnerability research, and we'll conclude. So, why well, look at Windows Defender Antivirus? Uh, this is Microsoft's built-in AV product that uh, is installed by default on all Windows systems. Uh, Windows 10, it runs by default 
which means that over 50% of Windows 10 systems have Windows Defender and Virus running. Uh, the Defender name now seems to cover a variety of mitigations and security controls built into Microsoft uh, OS, OSs. So you have, you know, Control Flow Guard, Emet, ATP, all these different things now get lumped under you know, Windows Defender Device Guard, Windows Defender Application Guard, Windows Defender Exploit Guard, and so forth. Again, here we're focused on Windows Defender Antivirus. And it also runs unsandboxed as NP authority system, meaning if you found a vulnerability inside Defender, uh, that would give you initial RC if you could exploit that. It will skip you a privesk up to system, and you're nice. running inside an AV process. So the AV would be unlikely to catch you doing anything malicious because it's not going to flag itself, say, doing some malicious writing file, injecting another process, and so forth. It's also surprisingly easy for attackers to reach. To reach. I've not tried this myself. But friends of mine at Google Project Zero have uh, told me that you could send an executable to someone who has a Gmail open. Kaput. And if they have that Gmail open in the background tab, uh, Chrome, uh, the Chrome browser will cache the downloaded file that just hits the inbox. That'll hit like a mini filter driver on the Windows OS. And then the file that's written to the desk will be passed off to Defender to be scanned. So you can actually reach this in a remote fashion, um, even though you would think this is a traditional host based uh, protection system. My motivation came from uh, this tweet from Tavis Ormandy at Google Project Zero, who about a year ago found uh, some vulnerabilities in Defender's JavaScript engine with Natalie Silvanovich, also at Project Zero. And I had a background reverse engineering, and reverse engineering antivirus software, did some work we called AD Leak, with Jerry Blackthorn is here in the audience. Uh, a couple years ago, we found that at uh, Black Hat and Woot. Uh, but I never actually analyzed Windows Defender, and I always wanted to. And I also had this interest in JavaScript engines, so I took on Defender and looked at the JavaScript engine for about four months. Then we designed that work and moved on to reverse engineering the Windows emulator, which I'm, under here, I'm here to talk about today. So our target is mpengine.dll. This is the main DLL that provides uh, Windows Defender scanning functionality. It's a very large one, it's a one device large. Um, and again, this is not the part of Defender that's, say, doing hooking for system calls or uh, filtering you know, disk writes. This is the main scanning engine. This you take a buffer of data and you say, this is malicious or it's not malicious. That's its purpose. Uh, and inside MP Engine are a variety of scanning engines. I'm focusing today on the Windows binary emulator, which is one of the many scanning engines. Before we go into my work on the Windows binary engine, just want to quickly recap what I did reverse engineering the JavaScript engine. This bit.ly link there will take you to that presentation. And this was presented at a recon Brussels in Brussels, Belgium, back in February. So, okay, Windows so. Defender has a JavaScript engine that's used for analysis of potentially malicious JavaScript code, and I reversed it from binary. I used a custom loader and shell for dynamic experimentation uh, with uh, help from Rolf Rolls. So, thanks, Rolf. Throughout the JavaScript engine, I found AV instrumentation callbacks that inform the heuristic antivirus portion of Defender about actions that the potential malicious JavaScript is taking that then uses to determine whether this is malicious JavaScript or not. So you And I also found that developers seem to prioritize security at the cost of performance. So the JavaScript engine is very pared down, stripped down, doesn't have shitting or many of the other features and optimizations that make the modern JavaScript engines fast. On the other hand, I found it to be relatively secure, and the attack surface to be relatively pared down. You'll see some common themes like that throughout this presentation today. As far as related and prior work goes, there's really only a handful of prior publications on reverse engineering antivirus software at all, let alone the emulators within them. There is, of course, the work I mentioned, AV Leak, which I did with some collaborators at RPI, um, some of who are here. Uh, there's also a book, uh, work from Hoxian Koret touching on this. There's Tavis Ormandy's work at Google Project Zero. And uh, there actually are some talks from the AV industry itself, such as uh, Mihai uh, Shirak's talk from, uh, I this was Hack.Lu also, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, as a AV industry developer, talking about how Defender's Emulator works. But really, there's not been a lot of offensive work or work from people who don't work in the AV industry looking at these systems. I'd also mention that PADIS are a great source of sort of open source intelligence about how AVs work. Chris Damas called that in his presentation looking at patents on X6 processors. Jetzt brenne ich doch. Vielleicht haben wir von hinten angegriffen. Das kann man das mal jemand erklären. Aber das ist nur selten. Ich weiß es nicht. Ich weiß es nicht. Also, es gibt ein traditionelles AV-Modell, und ich glaube, es gibt ein paar Ideen, wie sie das machen, die sie scannen und such as file hashes, sequences of bytes, or file trace, and then I have some heuristics about, say, imports, or they recognize a static MD5 hash, or they recognize a particular snippet of code that's known to be associated with a given malware family. Um, 
but this is really an outdated model. And this is an outdated model, you know, 15, 20 years ago, this was outdated. Uh, because malware could evade these hard-coded signatures uh, with hacked code by creating novel binaries, um, you know, packing obfuscation. You heard a lot about wow, that's that's viruses out. back in the early 2000s. So the solution that, again, 15 to 20 years ago, the AV industry came up with was uh, runtime dynamic analysis on the endpoint through emulation. So actually running these unknown binaries in a virtualized environment and looking for signatures there. This technology goes by a number of names. You may hear it called sandboxing, heuristic analysis, dynamic analysis, detonation, virtualization, and so forth. At the end of the day, it's all emulation, and that's what we're talking about today. So an overview of emulators in general. You begin by loading the potentially malicious unknown binary that you can't identify with more expensive analyses, or less expensive analyses, rather, such as hashing or uh, heuristic based on imports. You're going to run the, run the binary in an emulated environment, so you're going to have a CPU emulator for the particular architecture of binary, generally x86. Uh, you're going to run that in the simulator, and throughout running, uh, you're going to collect these observations, and you'll terminate it at some point, such as length of time it run, number of instructions that have been executed, number of API calls, amount of memory the malware is used, or so forth. And throughout this, you're collecting heuristic observations about the malware's behavior that inform uh, detections. You might also look for things like if the malware calls create file and writes a known malware signature uh, with create file, you, you hook that implementation, and every create file you would look for, say, a known malware signature or a known malware hash at that point. Moving into talking about tooling and process, how I did what I did. Reverse engineering wise, I used pretty standard industry tools like IDA uh, and BINDIF for patch analysis. So as Google Project Zero was discovering some vulnerabilities, I was able to diff. Uh, updates of the DLL and find what changed, how the Microsoft tried to mitigate vulnerabilities inside Defender. Found overall there's about 30,000 functions uh, across this massive 12 megabyte DLL. So this is enormous, uh, probably one of the largest binaries I've ever taken on reversing. Um, obviously people look at firmware that are much larger, but this is really absolutely monolithic for a single Windows DLL. What does make this job a lot easier is that Microsoft publishes PDBs, and it's basically debug databases that have symbols and sometimes type information uh, for the binaries. Dynamic analysis-wise, um, AVs are generally harder to look at than traditional software. Uh, dynamic analysis does require some work on the part of the user or the reverse engineer. In Defender's case, it's a protected process, meaning that even if your system or admin on your local system, you cannot attach the process to debug it. Even if you have, a, have SE debug privilege or anything like that, you can't still can't attach. It's protected by the OS. The solution to this is to go into a kernel debugger and, for example, debug an entire VM and then attach the kernel process or the oh, process from the kernel. But that's very expensive and yeah, just annoying to do. So uh, introspection is also challenging. Actually, if you can say pause and breakpoint, actually understand what's going on in the other state can be difficult uh, with a debugger, even though you have a debugger running. Scanning on demand can be difficult to trigger. Uh, if you want Ooh, to was any light on here. go into a GUI interface, click a couple buttons, select something, choose it, you know, it's a pain to do that. You want an automated command line interface, just say scan this file, scan that file, scan the other file. And code here reachability may be configuration or heuristics dependent. Meaning that local See, settings about uh, so how aggressive the scanning is, what time limits you allow the scanner to have, all of these can get in the way <sighs> of uh, effective scanning. The solution is to build a custom loader for these AV binaries. And it was nice that I was able to start with some work that Tab Storm and Google Project Zero did on building his own custom harness for Defender, which I then extended extensively. So, first off, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tavis's existing work, which he called Load Library. So, Tavis built a PE loader for Linux. So this is able to take a Windows DLL on Linux and load it up ah, right, and run it. Um, this is not a full replacement for some line or any other uh, Windows emulation. This is just enough to get Windows Defender itself running and shimming out uh, system calls and ah, Windows like Defender awesome. to, to Linux implementations. So talking through how Tavis's tool works, um, and the link here will take you to the GitHub project. We begin with a Linux binary, just standard user binary, and it's going to load and resolve uh, imports for mpengine.dll. So this is just the process of taking the DLL, relocating it in memory, doing standard DLL loading yeah, process, and putting it in you know, a rewrite and a buffer, and put it in a buffer. In the IP, the import address table, you're going to go through and shim out the implementations of various Windows APIs with Linux replacements. So for example, create file is replaced by a call to open file or fopen, and say write files replace their call to fwrite. 
inside this engine, you have an emulator. And for now, just remember that there's a table called GSYS calls, which is a table of function pointers to various emulations of Windows 8 and Live functions. And on the outside, we have our malware binary uh, with your with the standard MZ header on the binary. We're going to call a function exported by Defender called rsignal. This is the main entry point to Defender. Uh, we give it a buffer of data, and it's going to come back with a malware classification. We then go through a process of selecting a scanning engine. So Defender may do some initial analyses of things like static hashes. If it will fail, and it can't determine whether it's a binary or not, we're ultimately going to write it in the emulator. The emulator will run, make its determination whether this is a malicious binary or not and then come back with a virus identification, or it might say this is just benign. So a quick demo, I'm going to show you scanning with MD client. This is how some of these unmodified uh, harness for Windows Defender. So here we're scanning the eCar test file. This is an industry standard test file um, for any AV. And you see we scan the file and it comes back and says we found ecar.com. So that's kind of a demo. We're actually taking this uh, Windows code, running it on Linux, and seeing what happens when we scan the binary. In addition to using this harness from Pavis, I did some dynamic analysis with customized code coverage tools developed by the Marcus Rossidum of Red Team Systems, a fellow RPI stack alumnus as well. And what's a tool called Lighthouse? It lets you scan a binary or run a binary and there's a binary. Was blend der scheiß Bau nicht? Collect coverage information and then visualize uh. it in IDA Pro. So you can see here this control flow graph. You include basic clocks to those that have been hit during a given scan. And I found this to be extremely powerful yeah. and useful tool when I was doing my reverse engineering. I did find it interesting to see how our flake uh, just about a month or two ago gave a keynote at SSTSC where he was talking yeah. about challenges of introspectability with malware or with sort of binaries. And how can be very difficult to introspect and analyze and debug binaries, and how ultimately that's a hindrance to security. And how are explicitly called out the challenges of analyzing Windows Defender as one example of this, where because Defender is in a privileged process on Windows, you can't analyze it under a tool like PIN or Dynamo Rio. Of course, we're running on Linux, so we sidestep the whole issue of the protection process, and we can actually run and visualize coverage. Okay, now moving into the meat of the presentation, talking about reverse engineering the emulator itself. First off, we're going to talk about startup of the engine, then we move to the CPU emulation, ah, and the communication, and then the environment and emulation. With water, with water, yeah, with so first off, the first thing that has to happen when we want to emulate a good binary is we have to load in yeah. and initialize the emulator yeah. to start it up. So we're going to call the rsignal function, which provides this entry point for Defender scanning, and gives it a buffer of data to be scanned. Yeah, cool, that's not easy. And uh, it will return the malware. So these results are actually the cache as well. There's lots of you know, stuff going in the back end. We don't really care about. We don't really care about just going into the emulator itself. So oh my God! These are not traps. These are not traps. Memory for execution. Uh, uh, various C++ uh, 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 objects that are involved in the emulation it's itself. It's process itself. Various subsystems in Defender. For example, the object manager. We have to create an object manager instance. We have to set up the virtual file system and so forth. We're going to load the binary that's to be analyzed, resolve its imports and Nein. things like that, and then initialize virtual DLLs in this emulated process memory space. Yep. These are akin to the real DLLs on a real Windows system that provide, in, or provide Windows API functionality. Oh, Throughout this process, the Fender is collecting heuristic observations about the binary. And you can see these on the right side here, for example, things like PEA, suspicious section size. Yeah, so these may inform some heuristic classifications Oops. in the Fender because there's a suspicious section size, maybe this is malware. Um, we'll also be right, so right, uh, you can see some min-win resolution resolving API MS, some the API uh, DLLs. And here in the bottom left, I have yeah, um, an example of uh, when we're setting up a name for the minor to be emulated. But I need the lava. If the uh. minor is a Windows executable, it'll be called myapp.exe. This is something you could write a base of malware where it says, if my name is myapp.exe, I won't run. I know that I'm running inside Defender. And indeed, if you Google this string, you will find malware binaries online that explicitly look for the name myapp.exe and choose not to run if they see it. After startup and initialization, we're going to move into talking about CPU emulation. So technically what Defender does is not so much emulation as it is dynamic translation. Yeah, this is a fuck. Of key mode, a quick emulator does, which is basically taking uh, assembly code of a given language, lifting it up into an IL or an integrated representation, yeah, and then taking that IL and dumping it out with a JIT engine uh, into executable code. 
Um, so Defender supports a number of architectures. You can see here in the Enum on the right, ranging from x86, so three different uh, flavors, up to ARM, and even VM Protect. So they can take the VM Protect opcodes, lift those into run IO, and dump them out into sanitize x86 to be run analyzed, as well as ARM. Now, this subsystem is incredibly complicated and not really a primary focus on the research. We'll review it in the next few slides. Flop, 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 flop. We begin with the uh, architecture to IL lifting process, which are in the, these giant functions that are architecture underscore to IL. You can see an example Oops. from the sixth to IL triangulator. Just an absolutely massive, ugly switch case. Uh, thousands of switch cases. You know, IL gets super slow when you load this in. And basically what we're doing here is grabbing a byte of opcode from an XD6 opcode, looking at that, uh, determining what it is, and then emitting the according uh, or related uh, Windows Defender intermediate representation for that binary uh, operation. And you can see an example here in the bottom right. Uh, it's all instructions uh, lift to uh, 13 in the Windows Defender IL. Fucking... Um... Things. There's nice. also, after we lift to the IL, there's an IL emulator uh, that runs in software. So we can actually Look. run binaries in software. I never observed this being run during my research, did some code coverage analysis, never saw it being hit. My uh, intuition is that this is so that we can support uh, analysis of x 6 ah, binaries on non x 6 hosts. So, for example, if you're running Windows Defender on Windows for ARM, you don't have to have a IL to ARM JIT engine, you can just run it in software. My as far as the IL to XD6 JIT translation, uh, we're taking IL code and then translating a basic block at a time, similar to the way Kimo does things. And I did observe this JIT being uh, used during my research. Defender will actually uh, handle unique instructions that it can't handle with emulation uh, through software bound emulation. So if it can't give an instruction out, it'll actually generate a call directly into a function that does that. We're going to show them the next slide. But just you can see here, uh, circled in red on the left, you can actually see the opcodes being constructed. So they're actually constructing a move, do, move an immediate and then call the immediate, calling directly into a function handling a particularly unique architectural instruction or event. Uh, over here on the uh, right, you can see the LEA opcode actually being emitted. The opcode in XD6 is 8D. So as you're the from the LEA IL instruction down to XD6, you do 8D and then you XOR or, or OR that with a register um, to uh, register a value to create a valid x86 instruction. Uh, Microsoft actually documented this in 2005 at Virus Baldwin, a paper called Defeating Polymorphism Beyond Emulation. And it's definitely worth checking out. And it's really remarkable that Microsoft was experiment with, experimenting with techno this technology almost 15 years ago. ILs are so hot right now, we're explaining ILs for things in Fire Ninja or various program analyses. But Microsoft was doing this on the endpoint, you know, on your, your computer, your grandma's computer, everyone's computer. 15 years ago, they were lifting up the ILs, jitting them out, doing analyses on them. It's very impressive, I think. So then we have these architecture-specific uh, escape handlers, which is unique architectural events that we can't emulate uh, with the JIT engine. Uh, you can look at this offline to see an exact listing of some of these emails. And an example of one of these options uh, would be this software emulation of the x86 CPU ID instruction. So this is an instruction that provides unique information about a given x86 CPU. And here it's emulated in software. So I've shown here, I wrote a malware binary that uh, does the that I this argument hex 80001. And when we run this binary inside the Thunder uh, analysis engine, we'll get this code coverage. And we'll actually see the little bounce off the block where that same immediate is compared. And then we go down the true branch because the immediate that our code was doing matches up with the immediate here in software. And then they can emulate CPU ID by setting register state accordingly. All right, moving into talking about my instrumentation, which is a big enabler for the rest of my research. So the problem with uh, analyzing Windows Defender, and I said there's very little introspection, it's very difficult to tell what's going on inside of it. All you really get out of it is virus identification. Now you could exploit virus identification as sort of a side channel to extract information about inside the engine. And indeed, that's what I did with my project a couple of years ago, was exploiting malware identifications as a side channel to get information about what's going on inside various AV emulators. Um, but this is really slow and inefficient. So a smarter technique is to go in and sort of give us a malware eyes view of what's going inside in the engine. So mpengine.dll has various functions that are invoked when various Windows APIs are called by malware running inside of it. And we can then hook those uh, emulation functions and provide our own implementation. Das sehen, so we can mob stuff up by IO path. And we also in turn inform uh, the malware binary inside about what actions we want it to take. 
So let me give you a, a diagram of that. Oh my gosh, this is this. the original uh, load library diagram I showed you. This is how some of these tools can in an unmodified state. This is how it works. And I have an unmodified G6 table. This is the table of about 120 functions without emulations for various Windows uh, APIs. I hope to replace those implementations with my own implementations of various common functions like LP Debug String A or WinExec. So when these functions are now called by our malware binary inside the engine, instead our functions are invoked. So here's an example of our LP Debug String A. The process we have to take on, which is resolving the relative offsets of these functions and then setting hooks in the rewrite execute um, DLL. Oh, so what this looks like is this, yeah, but here in the top right, we have yeah, our vermutlich. first assembly, or decompilation rather, of Windows Power and the Power Strong A. Basically, you yeah, know, uh, all it does is retrieve a single parameter off the virtual ah. stack, and then bump the tick count, so it bumps the time a little bit in the emulator. And here in the center of the screen, Cannot. I have my re-implementation of this. Ah. So we're going to walk through this. Ah. First off, we have our declaration, so this takes a void pointer. Uh, PE bars T is a massive, about half a megabyte large structure passed to all these Windows API emulations. Yeah, I kind of know the exact definition of that function. So we just provide uh, a ticket void pointer. Just say we, we're not going to worry about it. It's just a, a pointer. Then we have this local thing to hold parameters to the function. So the function has parameters passed to it in the virtualized emulated environment. And we want to interact with those. So we have to make some space for them. I'm going to use a function internal defender to pull off one parameter from the virtual stack. So we're going in, talking, you know, looking at the virtual ESP and EDP state, uh, in this virtual memory space, and then pulling off the void by value that was there. I'm actually calling back into defender from my hook function to do that. I'm calling the function get string that's going to translate a virtual address inside the emulator to a real yeah, address that we can interact with the whole yeah. And now we can just print that string standard out. So this sounds like a lot, but let me show you a quick demo of it in action. So here I have a malware binary that's going to say hello DEF CON when we run it. It says output drug string and hello DEF CON. And I'm going to scan that binary inside my hooked and modified version of Tavis' load library tool. And you'll see here it says hello DEF CON now. Going back to Visual Studio, we're going to add a new line. This is a live demo. Of course, this is a pre recorded video because the DEF CON organizers this year wanted us to do pre recorded videos. But I was doing this live. I just rebuilt the, the binary. And here scanning it again. It's now going to say, hello, DEF CON. And then also, this is a live demo. So this is what's happening is inside the emulator, our malware binary is calling this function. And because we've hooked the implementation of the output debug string A emulation in Defender, our function is being called instead. And we're going to run it one more time, I believe, uh, with some more information. You can see here uh, we have a more rich debug output, and we can see things like the exact addresses passed to it uh, from the virtual memory space. So this is a big enabler for the rest of my research, the fact that I had this sort of window into what's going on inside the emulator. I can have my malware miner inside, take observations, and then post them out to the outside world. As far as my malware binary goes, I'll call it myapp.exe. Again, that's the name of all binaries running inside Defender's engine. It does this IO communication with output and some other functions. On the right side, you'll see a list of factors that I found could impede emulation and the ways I get around them. So I had to really massage the linker, optimizations, imports, in order to get binaries that were consistently emulated by Defender. And I'll be releasing some code at the end of this talk that will have a very simple Visual project that I found I was able to get consistently emulated when scanned with the library. Finally, as far as the reverse engineering goes, moving into the Windows emulation and the Windows environment, I think the most interesting part of this presentation. I'm going to start off by talking about the user mode environment. So this is the emulation of a fake Windows user mode. So in Windows Defender, there is a virtual file system. Um, uh, does any real system have a file system and files that malware might look at? Defender virtualizes one. There's about 1,500 functions on their virtual file system, and you'll see a variety of things in there. Mostly it's fake executables that are there for uh, malware binders to, for example, infect or you know, do different things to that could be indicators that they are, in fact, malicious binaries. So I'll do a quick demo of dumping the file system. Again, using that mechanism that I showed you of posting data out without the debug string A, we're able to enumerate the entire file system and dump it in just a few seconds. I did here actually use a slightly more sophisticated hook. Uh, where I was doing WinExec, and I'll show some yeah, examples in my backup slides. It's not as simple as just having a bunch of them. But you can see here, in just a second or two, we dumped the entire virtual file system from inside Windows Defender. We had a malware binary go inside there, enumerate all the files that it could see, and then dump them out. 
And we have to open them up. We see that there's about 1,500 of them in this virtual file system. And you'll see things like this, the word goot repeated thousands of times over in a file called AAA touch me not .exe. Uh, my intuition is that this binary is right there on the, the C drive, and it's there so that a malware binary might read that file in and say send it over the network or encrypt it or do some, some indicator that we are indeed malware. So maybe if you touch it, that might be an indicator that you're malicious. Uh, the reason has the goat, uh, goat or goat placed a thousand times over. Presumably, it is a goat file. That's sort of an AV industry term for a sacrificial file, like a sacrificial goat that you can like get infected or changed or encrypted by malware in order to have the malware kind of show its true intent. So that was an interesting artifact. Again, this is also something that you could write malware that says, if I see the word goat a thousand times over in a file called AAA, touch me not. I know I'm running inside Defender, therefore I'm not going to run. I'm not going to be malicious. We'll see fake config files. You can see that these are very clearly written by a real human with comments like blah, blah, uh, and you know, generic SQL queries. We have a virtual registry that has thousands of entries and enumerated the whole registry and up and that out. We'll see things like this. So for example, there's a registry entry for World of Warcraft. Presumably there's malware that maybe looks for World of Warcraft registry entry and touches it. So if we saw a call to say red key on World of Warcraft, that might be a indicator um seine Viren besser zu verstecken. Äh, für Education und Purpose auch nicht, natürlich. Die anderen Stelle sind auch agil, by the way. Ach, der andere Stelle ist auch hässlich. Alle neuen Steine sind hässlich, da machst du nichts. So there you can see, uh, real time just took less than a second to dump the entire process listing. All right, back to the presentation. In addition to this environment, we have Windows user mode code that runs to provide emulations of various Windows API functions. Uh, and there are generally two types of Windows API emulations. Um, a kind of those, uh, Windows API function is a real Windows system. There are also today in user mode, which are yeah, also the same emulator. And those that resolve into a syscall, just like a, a a track to a native emulation here in Defender. Uh, symbols indicate that these uh, emulated virtual DLLs that are in the emulated environment are called VDLLs. And because they are simply DLLs from the file system dump, we can just go reverse that dump and reverse those DLLs by throwing them in IDA on their standard Windows PD files. When we look at them, they're definitely not the real uh, indications of things like kernel 32 that you would see in a real system. So we'll see things like this. Um, in kernel 32, if we call it get username, it will return a hard-coded string of John Doe. This is, again, something we could use to create a base in Howard that says, if I see the username John Doe, I'm not going to run. We'll see a computer name Hal 9000. Ah, that's natürlich auch geil, wenn man sich den Username wirklich verwendet für sein normales Host-System und dann die Viren einen nicht angreifen. Das ist mega funny. Eigentlich sollte man sich überall diese Goat-Files und so hinpacken. Leute, 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 ich bin gerade Big Brain unterwegs. Man sollte mal diesen Windows Defender so analysieren, wie der Dude gemacht hat und dann sich überlegen, was so ein Attacker denken würde und dann einfach das eigene Host-System äh, so gestalten, dass es aussieht, als wäre es das Antivirenprogramm und dann ähm, ist man ein bisschen sicherer gegen einige Viren, die versuchen smart zu sein. <lacht> Sehr mega funny, Leute. Takes is it needs to just go grab a memory segment at uh, FS18. So they actually support memory segmentation at the architectural level, so they can just do that actual instruction inside the emulator. Or we'll see complex functions like RTL set sample security stripper, just knocked out, they just return zero. Okay, it's halt die Frage von hier oben können jetzt auch Mobs runterkommen. So it's natürlich nicht so geil. Lots of complex functions complex functions are not fully emulated by defender. Ist da eine Ja, das ist halt unsicher oder so. Man, kein Plan. Boundary. How, how do we get into more complex simulations, such as those requiring access to a virtual file system? These functions are implemented with a hyper call like instruction called API call. 
This is, of course, not a real x86 instruction with the outcode 0f, ff, f0, and the four byte immediate describing the particular function to be invoked. But when this instruction is called on the virtual CPU, it's going to generate a call into a native mpengine.dll function that provides emulation of these unique functions. So these are complex functions that need to cause a complex handling. Das mache ich dann einfach alles in den Track und irgendwann oder so, keine Ahnung. Ja, kein Plan. Uh, this disassembly here is provided by a processor module. I have an article coming out on Hawker GTFO issue 19 describing exactly how this IDA processor extension module works. So once we have these API call instructions running, we're going to trigger a call to a function that looks at the G syscalls table, which is the table of these function pointers and these hashes. Once we look for the four byte immediate that was called from the API call instruction and then dispatch the appropriate function that matches up with it. So Kind of a workflow of what this looks like. Uh, inside the emulator here, we have a uh, kind of a that up, It's going to do things like log the number of times it was called. Nein. So if it's called more than 900 times, that much of this is going to But ultimately, it's going to resolve then into this function API call kernel 32 output debug string A, which is then going to use the API call instruction to see the 0 FFFF0 BB14 BB32. It's going to see that instruction. And then Fuck. the hyper calls from stack what is that transition from the emulation so out of this aus. managed uh, dynamic translation context. What's the matter, PKX? Of course, this is what we hooked when we show had our own output bug string A implementation. So I was using the post information out of the emulator. Enumerating the emulated functions that have native emulations. These are the, the yellow functions are those that are not found on real Windows systems. So they're specific to Defender, for example, for debug functionality or unique backdoor management. Uh, here's more of them, including a number of VFS functions, which are for low-level access to the virtual file system. So all these native emulation functions take that PE vars T, a very large, half megabyte large structure, containing everything about a given emulation context. And then we have template of parameters functions that are used to retrieve parameters of the function from the emulated snack. And then programmatic APIs for manipulating return values, register state, the CPU tick count, or time. Uh, all that sort of stuff can be programmatically managed through manipulations of the PEVARS T structure. Virtual memory can be interacted with with a API similar to that found in many uh, emulation engines, such as Unicorn Engine, where we can memory map virtual memory into our real memory space and manipulate it there. And there are wrapper functions for common operations like reading a single D word, reading or writing live streams, or videos. These all have uh, kind of these utility functions wrapped around them to make it easier for developers. Moving into kernel internals. So we've talked kernel about internal. Internal. <laughs> <laughs> have these have 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 kernel mode or the native emulations. Let's look at how those native emulations are themselves implemented. Die so wenn man sich bei K verschreibt. Binary, you know, cool. XC, you know, drivers. And these are really the core of the Windows uh, OS or really the NT kernel. Uh, these, these are included examples of the option manager, process management, okay. file system access, the registry, so. the registry hives, and synchronization primitives for IPC. So first off, we're going to talk about the object manager. Okay. This is an essential part of the Windows executive that provides uh, management for handles. So, Anytime you are opening a file, a socket, so forth, it's going to go through the object manager. And Defender okay, supports five types of objects with this object manager. Up, so. so these are file, thread, event, mutant, which is a, a singular mutex, and semaphore. And these are stored in the big object manager map uh, here in mpengine.dll. They're stored in memory as C objects, and they all inherit from the common parent class object manager object. We then have some Wunderschön! Object, and you can see I've made a little larger Eins, zwei, drei, vier. unique traits uh, to those particular C++ objects, such as the M file handle uh, thing in the file object, or I have the an English accent, so many videos show you. Processes can wait on even new text. 
C++ RTI is used to RTTI is used to cast between these subclasses to their parent class when they retrieve. I swat I. And then Commander can be interacted with uh, programmatically um, by these various functions. So if we open a new tent, oh, we uh, should grab that object and mess with it. Here. If we uh, open a file object, uh, it's actually called Commander object, I which will use our tool to first check the type and then explicitly use RTTI to cast I the file object I and fail if the retrieved handle is not indeed a file. Handle. We'll also see things like the pseudo handle for current process uh, is a more advanced hex screen. Again, we use our device of malware based on seeing that our own handle is one two three four. We have a virtual file system that provides emulation and access to a file system, and this is accessed through the standard ntdll ntwrite file, ntcreate file, yeah, and so forth. Like as well as these lower level <laughs> functions, which provide the the wand, or unsanitized access the wand, uh, to the file system uh, emulation. Uh, so moving into talking about AV instrumentation, so all the heuristics and analyses the AV is doing throughout the runtime. So there are some internal functions that are exposed through the hypercall API call interface. No, I must mention that. We're going to look at a few of these. Uh, First off, NP report event, which is used to communicate yeah, information and malware binary actions with defenders who risk the tech convention. So these are in some of these user mode uh, emulations, such as get username or get computer name. Those don't require trapping into a full native emulation, and that would increase the attack surface greatly if they all did. Oh, so we do want to inform defenders that the given function is called. So if get system directory is called, it'll report uh, event 12331. Let's go. Or if you create a process and you do it uh, suspended, it'll Wenn ich wieder warte, das Gold auf irgendwas anderes zu spenden, bis dahin wird die Base nie wieder ausgeraubt. A uh, process that was created. And the report might be called in more cases. You can see here, just more examples. This is called thousands of times throughout these VDLLs. And more concrete Yo. example of how Guys this so into this. the uh, identification of potential ah. malicious binaries is here where we see that if we call terminate process on a paid in 700 range, which uh, is the number of the various AV processes are in 700 range, he'll trigger a call down to report event 1, 2, 3, 4, 9. Yeah, Gold is just a mix of steel and holz. That's probably a good indicator you're making. Axe. 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 Axe
And I found that I could bypass this mitigation by simply finding the API call stubs in memory in our VDLLs, which I can reverse engineer. And I could just bounce off the API call instruction and hit this uh, interface, these interfaces with my own uh, controlled That's arguments. So this is not good. No, yeah, I yeah. report this to Microsoft, and they told me this is not a trust boundary. Kind of a classic Microsoft response to a lot of vulnerability disclosures. That's not quite a trust boundary, um, you know, unless you actually found an actual vulnerability, like uh, you know, actual buffer overflow in there. The fact that there's this logical flaw that I can hit internal debug interfaces and do things like stop emulation right then and there, or change microcode in the emulator, that's evidently not a vulnerability according to Microsoft. Okay, GG so an example of a bypass here doing something pretty benign, just we're going to hit output debug to your name. Yeah, what does that mean? Do you not fix it or click on CVE or what? What does that mean? Vulnerabilities can even have bugs. And just bounce off this emulation, and when this runs, we hit output debug to your name. Now, more maliciously, we can sort of hit uh, NT control channel uh, in that internal debug interface left in by developer, so maybe debug or administer the engine. And we can set our own heuristics, like for example, if we call virate body found, we'll trigger immediate malware detection. So a quick demo of that. So in this video, you can see we're calling up a debug string A in the legitimate way, and then calling it with our debug string A at use. Um, through this, uh, unintended Locker, die sitzen irgendwo hinterm Hügel, die wollen, dass ich mich jetzt ins Bett lege und dann schnappt hier die Pfanne zu, die Schlinge. Die Schlinge, war das wäre eine richtige Ehrenaktion, wenn die so hier mit X-Ray angesneakt werden kommen und dann gesehen hätten, ah, das ist ein Bett und dann bauen die da eine Falle drum und dann zack, boom. <lacht> ja, ich bin wieder voll mein Film am Schieben. Sorry, das ist so viel Trash Talk in dieser Episode. Now, uh, the, again, the implications of this is we can hit these internal debug interfaces with attacker control arguments. Probably not a good idea. Finally, I want to talk a bit about fuzzing. So I was able to then fuzz any of the APIs, um, basically working on some more complex mechanisms to allow our, our channel to be a two-way I.O. channel, not just an output channel. Uh, I took MWR Labs' OSX kernel fuzzer, which generated random values to fuzz the OSX kernel, and I folded that into my code, uh, generating random values at each time. And then I pushed those into the emulator, and I was able to do things like fuzz anti file. Yeah, I know, it's not so much Wasser and so, but... In a unique way that got around uh, the sanitization that anti file normally does. I reported this crash in VFS write, but through anti write file without having to abuse the API call instruction. Warte mal, ein Wasser geht doch vier lang. Da muss ich doch nur alle... And then fuzz that. Leute, warte mal. Ein Wasser macht doch so... Vier Felder. Das heißt, ich muss nur alle acht das bewässern. Also. So, soll ich jetzt. Also eigentlich hier. Ne? Weil. Dann haben wir. Boah, ist das blöd. Äh, ja, 1, 2, 3, 4. Dann haben wir 1, 2, 3, 4. 5, 6, 7, 8, ja, ja, dann machen wir das so. Sorry. And this whole mechanism here with the params, uh, this is a more complex interface that I have for passing information in and out of the emulator. And basically in the outside of the emulator, we're generating fuzz input to give to inside of it. And we're calling the write file with those fuzz parameters and seeing what happens. Ja, much raw, much brain, Leute, ich weiß. So running this, you're going to see just run for quite a while. Uh, it's just going to keep running. In my experience, it took about seven minutes running single thread up to around 8,000 system calls per second to reproduce Tavis's crash. I mean, this is not a smart fuzzer. There's no AFL. There's no code cover information. It's just a dumb, but random values at the uh, defender in order to fuzz it. Nope, nope, There's nope. There's demo, and moving into the conclusion. We covered tooling instrumentation, CPU emulation basics for x86 so research and fuzzing for Windows Defender. Uh, we can cover a whole lot of other stuff, for example, uh, x86, uh, x64, excuse me, emulation, ARM emulation, VM protect emulation, 
The 16 bit emulation, there is a full DOS emulator uh, aside from the Win32 modern Windows system emulator. There's an, a 16 bit emulation built into the Defender, really interesting tax service as well. Aber not as well as that. Ja, klar, mit der auch. Okay. Um, a threading model, ja, how you can get multi threading ja. binaries inside of emulators. That's always a, a source of problems for AVM and emulators at large, so worth looking at. We're also analysis for .NET binaries. We're primarily looking at Windows PU binaries that are just compiled x86 code. Also inside MP Engine, we have unpackers, parsers, uh, JavaScript engine, which you can see in my Chuck on Brussels talk, other scanning engines, and .NET engine. Now, I want to say that people will be talking about AVs and what they can do, where they may or may not be vulnerable, but there's not a lot of ground truth. Digga, Microsoft, fix my den Scheiß, ey. They're really fascinated and harder to analyze, if they're a lot of fun. Das war doch früher, die so bunch of schmierig jetzt. Ich bin mal hier auf dem Weg, wie Malware wird gekauft und mitigiert und detected. Und was wir lernen, ein bisschen über die Entwicklung von Sorry, an den absoluten Disrespekt an den Speaker heute. Ein paar Claims über AV-Vulnerabilities. Das ist eigentlich ein geiler Talk, kann man nicht sagen. Und wie wir Sonomity arbeiten und ein bisschen in Hoxian arbeiten. But there's really not a whole lot out, out there. Uh, I really like this tweet from Oxygen where he said, if you Google antivirus and kernels, all you find <laughs> is me, uh, him, and then Kavis Normandy. Um, so if you like this sort of work, definitely grab a copy of this book. It's an awesome book and really underappreciated by people. Um, just some really incredible work that went into that. That's a book, lol. I will book sehen. This tweet from Oxygen where he's the Antivirus Hackers Handbook. Ne? Here, if you're interested in the book and you don't want to talk about the talk. The Antivirus Hackers Handbook. Ne? Also hier, Buch Empfehlung. Notieren, so aufschreiben, kaufen. Internals, Spenden. Me, uh, him, Und favorisieren. I would say if you like this sort of work, definitely grab a copy of this book. It's an awesome book and really underappreciated by people. Um, just some really incredible work that went into that. I'm releasing some code later. Okay, äh, sieht's aus, als wären wir am Ende des Talks und somit auch am Ende der Episode. Ähm, 51 Minuten. Hat fun uploading me und das Feld ist immer noch nicht fertig, aber immerhin haben wir angefangen, es zu machen. Okay. Ja. Dann lassen wir unseren Herr Alexei Bulasel das Video beenden. Reverse Engineering Windows Defenders Emulator. Hit him up on Twitter. Thanks very much. Das war's mit dieser Episode.